We'll begin reading Matthew chapter 1, and, and we'll let you go by the time we're at chapter 28. And, uh, amen. All right, amen. And uh, anyway, but I think I might may do a, a few Christmas sermons along the way since it is that, that time of the year, it is the season. This is sort of like a Christmas sermon, sort of, maybe, kind of. And uh, but anyway, it, it, it ties into everything that we're doing today. And uh, probably what I should do is probably we should probably pray first and uh, then we'll begin. OK, Heavenly Father, thank you for you uh, for this uh, time that we've had together with one another and also with you in our presence. We're grateful and we're thankful for what we've experienced already here this morning. And uh, we're grateful you allowed us to meet like this in a place like this uh, for what will take place. We pray, Holy Spirit, you work in each one of our lives as this service continues, and uh, that's certainly something of, of value and, and uh, worthiness uh, for now and into the future uh, would take place in our lives. And uh, we pray, Lord, uh, uh, Lord, to thank you also for your word that we have before us that we can consider also year 2022 almost over, and your word is before us, and we're ever grateful. Help us, God, to be readers of your word. Help us not to be so concerned about how much we read, but that we do, and uh, that we would hide it in our heart. And Psalms, it says that we wouldn't sin against you, but for all other kinds of reasons, too, that we would seek to live it in our lives by your power, grace, and strength. But we pray, Holy Spirit, now, that you help us to be attentive or receptive to what the Lord God has for us from his word today. And uh, we trust you for that. We ask for it all the time. Uh, that you would help us, enlighten us, show us, teach us as we go along. But we'd ask now your blessing upon each one, and collectively this time is not only a help to us personally, maybe in our families, but also as a church fellowship that would encourage us along in the ministry uh, for the Lord Jesus. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I, I'm not going to read these things. Uh, 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 certain things are popping in my mind, uh, out of, out of, especially out of Matthew um, came to my mind, and, and I was just reading for myself. Uh, reading for myself. I, I usually don't watch news on TV. I don't usually listen to it on the radio. Maybe some talk programs once in a while to get some things. But anyway, but I read this this week. I read this this week. It says we're on the eve of destruction. Merry Christmas. And not only Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. We're on the eve of destruction. You know, over the last however how long, you know, Al Gore's pre uh, prediction about, you know, the world's going to burn up because of climate, uh, you know, the climate change. He didn't call it that. What did they call it? It wasn't climate change before. What was it? Global warming. We're all going to burn up now that we didn't burn up his 10 year prediction like like passed like a couple of years ago and we didn't burn up. Now we have climate change. So everything, anything that happens it's all about climate change. Now, I don't, I, I'll start believing climate change when I see the elites of the world and the elites of our country stop buying property on islands in the ocean that are like a foot above sea level and build like mini mansion uh, estates. When they stop doing that, I'll start thinking about it. And when they stop flying in their private jets that use all that fuel, and it have this giant carbon footprint they talk about, you know, then maybe I'll start thinking about things. But anyway, it says, Eve, we're on the eve of destruction. And then a song popped into my head from the 60s, you know, and, 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 and that's like in capsule form about the 60s, that song, we're on the eve, you know, the eve of destruction. Klaus Schwab pledges the world can find salvation at Devos 2022. I'm not, I can't read the whole article because I need to read scripture and get on with what I want to say. But listen, famine, the Merry, remember, Merry Christmas and what? Happy New Year and God bless you, ye merry men and women. Yeah. It starts famine, floods, pestilence, drought, plague, war, and rumors of war. That sounds like Matthew 25, I think it is. But anyway, uh, 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 these are the key issues facing the world today in the invitation only World Economic Forum. That means you and I could not attend. Okay. Next week in Devo, Switzerland, it's just a place to find the answers. 
and find the world's salvation, okay, find the answers provided by the select globalist elitist, elites founder Klaus Schwab declared Wednesday. The quote, he said, the return of war, the return of war, we're always in war. Has there ever not been war among human beings? Huh? The return of war, epidemics, and the climate crisis, the only climate crisis we have, actually truly have, is what's being created for us in the minds of certain people who lead us, who want to keep you in fear, and having uh, no sure foundation to plant your feet on to live your life. But anyway, I got, I got to stop. Listen, the return of war epidemics, climate crisis, all those disruptive forces have derailed, degra- derailed the global recovery. He must mean from COVID, which is man-made hysteria too. But anyway, Swab, Swab said the forums, he's the forums executive chairman, I told journalists in an almost biblical procrastinastic nation ahead of the convention start on Sunday. He said those issues must be confronted in Devos in the global food crisis. Didn't you know that either, did you? In particular, it needs our immediate attention. And then he uh, then says the return of the 2,500 strong in-person gathering after the coronavirus pandemic comes as the world struggles to meet the challenge presented by Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. It all comes down to trusting, it all comes down to trusting in the World Economic Forum. Okay? To find the correct outcomes and implement them as, stru- in, as instructed by them. That's Swab and his unelected workers. That's what they submit we should do. In a world, this is his quote, in a world which is becoming more fragmented, more divided, where many of the traditional multilateral organizations tend to become dysfunctional, or at least mistrustful, yeah, you should know that, a global platform based on informa- uh, informal, trust-faced, action-oriented cooperation will be ever more relevant, more important than ever, he declared. And it goes on about who's going to be there as they plan, the elitists plan how they're going to what? Have us implement what they want us to do supposedly so we will save the world from destruction. Oh, just to rest your soul too so you'll be a little more merrier. Uh, John Kerry is there too. He's going to be there too, you know. And he certainly has answers, and he said we were we only have like nine years left. And we're going to burn up or flood. We're going to either you're going to roast or you're going to drown, <sighs> or I guess you won't have dinner after a while, you know. Eve of destruction. Oh, it's 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 all it's generating fear that that for the most part is unfounded. Is presented as reality that global leaders want to impose upon you. And then I thought of that song, and if I turn it this way, it's right side up. You know? About that. Remember the Eastern world is exploding, you know? Violence flaring, uh, you know, bullets loading. You're, you know, this is about, you know, with the with the draft. You know, you could you could get drafted into the military and go fight in Vietnam but you couldn't go buy a beer at the store because you're not old enough. You had to be 21, see. But anyway, you're old enough to kill, but not for voting. Uh, You don't believe in war, but what's that gun you're toting? The Jordan River even has bodies floating, you know, and tell you over, tell you, but you tell me over and over again, my friend, uh, you don't believe we're on the eve of destruction. It goes on and on and on about all the, all the disaster of the 1960s. I have to stop there because we have other things to do. So I I grew up, I I was born in the 50s, but, you know, part of my growing up was in the 60s, too, and I'm here. And I've been, I'm even, uh, I've been here long enough to be bald, you know. And even though I look like I'm 40, I'm much older than that, you know.
you know what? I'm going somewhere. You know, when we're going to observe the Lord's, the Lord's Supper today or receive communion, think about the Lord's death until he returns, and we're, we're going to observe this this time of, of, of remembering what he's done for us on the cross. We're doing it in remembrance of him. Uh, and that's what he, it says at the end of uh, Apostle Paul explaining to the Corinthian believers how to, how to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper. It's a memorial service. And he says, remember what the Lord said. He said, you, you want to do this? The Lord said, do this, the Lord's death. Remember the Lord's death until he comes again. It's talking about the second advent of Christ, not the first, right? The second coming of Christ. You, you observe the communion table or the Lord's Supper. You do that periodically, church, the Christian church does, until the Lord Jesus returns. Thinking about the second advent. It's in phases, it's in parts. He'll come uh, eventually at the second advent, the second coming of Jesus Christ. He'll be coming as a conquering king, full of power and great glory. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 19. And we're going to get there later in our sermon, okay? But but I, I want to think about not only not, not only the second advent, but I want to talk to you a little bit about the first advent, and that's the first time Christ came to earth. That's 2,000 years ago, and what we call, we celebrate his birth called Christmas. And with that, uh, you know, with these articles I read, this, this, there's some other things that, uh, in my mind about that. I was thinking about, about the fear nots. Those two words, fear not. That, that surround Christ's first advent that, that are connected to the Christmas story. There's a few of them. You read, fear not, in the Christmas story. And then I thought about Joseph. I thought about Joseph, you know, who was engaged to Mary and uh, by the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit was, was pregnant with, with the Lord Jesus, the God-man. Listen to this. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ, chapter 1, verse 18 of Matthew. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, had any physical intimacy, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, because that's how they phrased things back then, and that's how it was thought back then, even though they were not together yet, and they were engaged or espoused to be married. They were considered in that estate, even though they had not physically come together, and they were not physically living together yet. Then Joseph, her husband, when he found out that Mary's pregnant, okay, being a just man, a just man, and not willing to make Mary a public example because she's pregnant out of wedlock. And Joseph has no idea what in the world is going on. And he certainly knows he's not the father of that baby. So he's thinking about what to do about all this. He was minded to put her away uh, privately or, or privately and, and not make a public spectacle of her. Because unlike today, you know, pregnancy out of wedlock is like no big deal and nobody gives a rip and everything is just fine. But back then, it really did matter. Uh, they tried to hold a biblical morality about marriage and about children and about a proper order of how these things should come to pass. So he's thinking about, what, what do I do with this? And it says, well, he thought on these things. Well, he's thinking about this whole situation Mary is in now and he finds himself in. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a, a, a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. 
Isn't that wonderful? Verse 22, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, you know, this is my devotion Bible. It, it, I have underlined the one word in there, an action verb. It, he did. He did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. Isn't that good of him? Don't you think? You know? He didn't wait a week. He didn't flip a coin. He didn't go tie one on somewhere at the local tavern and, you know, get, you know, weep and wail about all this and what the situation was. No, he, he just decided, I'll, I'll do what God wants. In a very trying situation, I'll do what God wants. He's raised from sleep. He did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. But, wait a minute, verse 25, and he knew her not, no physical relationship, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Isn't that, isn't, isn't that an, an incredible story? Don't you think? But you notice verse 20? The angel Lord, the angel Lord said to Joseph, what? Fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to do now what I'm going to express to you, what God wants you to do about your situation with Mary. Don't be afraid to do this. You know, back then, he could have lost uh, all hope of having a family connection anymore. His family would shun. He could lose his friends. He could lose maybe economic opportunity maybe lose his craftsman job where he worked or if he was self-employed, he'd have a very difficult time to be able to work because people would look down at this family. Because from the outside world, it looks like, you know, somehow Mary's pregnant and they were never really, you know, the, 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 nothing was consummated and here she's pregnant. And Joseph didn't even know whose baby it was. The outside world, what it looked like from the outside world, this does not look good at all. And I think the fear is about all those kind of things and how he's going to live his life and how he's going to take care of his family if he does what, what's he going to do or what should he actually do with Mary? You know, should, should he stay with her and tough this one out? When as far as he sees, you know, she's been unfaithful to him. Now what do I do? And the angel of the Lord said, fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to do what God wants of you in this situation. And being the man that he was, he did what God wanted him to do. Isn't that wonderful? I know you're like, you're like, you're real silent because you're holding your breath. You wonder where I'm going to go with all this stuff. And listen, it's all right. Breathe. Just breathe. It's okay. But isn't that wonderful? May I say Mary's got the right guy? And actually, Joseph's got the right girl, too. He, he just doesn't know it yet. He's still trying to figure some things out. But the angel said, don't be afraid. I want you to do what God has for you in this situation. He's like, I didn't answer this. This is not what I was planning. This is not what I was thinking. You know, I'm way behind, but anyway, listen. You read about the Christmas story. Part of the Christmas story is actually, I think, if you back it up, the birth of John the Baptist, who was in human lineage, he was a, he was a cousin to the Lord Jesus. Uh, 
In Luke chapter 1, verse 13, Zacharias is in the temple. He's, uh, he's lighting the candles. He's burning incense. And lo and behold, by there, by the one side, the angel of the Lord shows up and says, tells, tells uh, Zacchaeus, Fear not, you know, what I've got to tell you. Listen, Elizabeth, your wife in old age is going to, you know, she's barren, but I'm telling you what, there's a miracle going to happen. She's going to conceive and have a man child. I want you to call his name John. But that angel told Zach, Zacharias, fear not. It's okay. Here I am. I probably startled you. You're probably one world. You know, he's been in the temple, say, you know, how many times, you know, doing his duties as a priest. And all of a sudden, he's never seen anybody show up before. Now he's got a talking angel before his face. And now he's like, wait a minute, hold on. But he said, no, this is what's going to happen. Your wife, Elizabeth, is barren, but she's an old age just like you. But you're going to have a child. You're going to have a man child and call his name John. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. And if you look at verses 26 through 38, you'll find out, you know, uh, uh, Mary, Mary was, was fearful of an angelic visitation. The angel had to tell her, fear not. Mary, listen, it's okay. You have found favor with God. It's okay what I'm sharing with you and what, what, how this is going to unfold and you will bear the God-man, Jesus. And what's happening to you inside is, is the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. You know, when Christ is born, the angels, you know, go to the shepherds who are watching their flocks by night, you know, out in the field, okay? And, uh, you know, and they're, they're making all kinds of noise. They're singing. They're joyful. There's all kinds of brilliant light and everything's going on. They're wondering what's going on. You know, we've been out in the field with these, with these stinky sheep for, for years on end and we never had anything like this happen. And the angels are announcing the birth of Christ and singing. They're all full of joy. And the one angel says to the shepherds, he says, fear not for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Don't be afraid about what you're uh, experiencing and what you will go see just soon after the angels leave the shepherds. So fear not is connected, uh, connected to the Christmas story uh, uh, and that first advent of Jesus Christ. It's, uh, fear not also is connected to the gospel story as it goes from Jerusalem to the other parts of the world. Especially Acts chapter 4, uh, the words fear not are not there, but, but rather a fearless boldness of the apostles testifying of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This, this fearless boldness had, had been uh, replaced it was replaced. It was the replacement for their lockdown fear of John chapter 20, verse 19, where they're locked up in a room somewhere because they are fearful of the Jews that they will come and have them arrested and they may face trial too and wind up on a cross like Christ did. Not only that in Acts chapter 4 about the gospel story also has fear not in Acts 27 verse 24 angel encouraged the apostle Paul not to fear for his life about being lost at sea in the great storm and the shipwreck surely the angel says surely he's going to make it to Rome to stand before Caesar as a witness for Christ fear not this storm is going to pass and you're going to make it to Rome to be a witness for Christ to that no good lunatic Caesar. Now the angel didn't say that, I said that. Okay. okay. The, the, the no good Caesar part, yes. So there's fear not in the Christmas story, there's fear not in the gospel story, there's fear, fear not in the Christian story. You know, Second Timothy chapter one, verse seven says, God's not given us what? A spirit of what? He ain't given us a spirit of fear. Love and power, and what a sound mind. How about that? Huh? You know, the sound mind replaces the fearful person. See? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6, The Lord said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake me, forsake thee. So, so then we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear what men shall do unto me. 
say, I'm not going to fear man. I'll honor God. If there's anybody I'll fear, I'll fear God. The Christian story, there's the fear not. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, one of, the, one of the Christian churches, you know, you find in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, uh, the angel of the Lord told him, listen, I know you're at this, you, you, your church is at the seat of Satan and, uh, and, uh, you're going to be persecuted and you could be arrested, persecuted 10 days and then you're going to fate, you're going to be executed, you're going to die, you know? But he said, what'd he say? Fear not. He said, how in the world is that, you know, you know, even in the midst of persecution, and even execution, just simply because you are a Christian, the Lord said, don't fear. Jesus said, you ought, to, you ought not fear what, what men can do to you, but uh, about, about the one that can sentence you to hell for unbelief. You ought to fear that. Thank you. Amen. Empty that other pocket. No, no I'm kidding. I said, you know, thank you. Yeah. But the Christian story. There's fear not even to the Christian churches that were facing persecution and some of them would actually lose their life for the cause of Christ. There's still fear not because you know when this life is over, you're not, are you? You'll live on, amen. amen. Now I want to return to the fear nots of the Christmas story. Each individual, listen to me, each individual, I got to be really quick, each individual was encouraged, or the individuals, if you think about the shepherds, each individual was encouraged, instructed, enticed not to fear as they lived, listen to me, this is real important, as they lived out their part and place as the first advent unfolded. You got that? You understand that, okay? Uh, uh, they were to fulfill their part and purpose without fear as the Lord's first first arrival was fast or quickly becoming a reality for humanity. That's a beautiful thing. God with us as the Savior, being full of what? Full of what? Grace and truth, it says, John chapter 1. Now, I want you to remember the communion service. For as often as you do show the Lord's death until he comes. That's the second advent. This time, the Lord's second advent, this time is a glorious thing for believers, but a gut-wrenching judgment on unbelievers. And you can read about that specifically in Revelation 19, verses what? 11 through 21, as he comes as a conquering king in power and great glory to judge the nations of the earth. Now, personally, I, I believe this, this second advent is fast approaching Jesus said he would return. The Apostle Paul expected even the Lord's return in his day. Uh, Jesus said he's coming quickly. If you read about, you get near the end of the book of Revelation, that he's coming quickly. And as the second advent begins to unfold, you find that it happens very, very quickly. It's, it's, it's a brisk step, one thing after another, one thing after another, once it actually begins. It happens very, very swiftly without hesitation, one thing after another. And the Lord describes it. You can read a bit about that maybe later on. The Lord describes a little bit about this in Matthew 25, verses 40, four, verse 4 through 31. And the Bible tells us, because I, I think we're right at the prelude of, of the second coming of Christ. And we're not at the eve of destruction, but, but, but it sure looks like it in many ways for many reasons. But no, it's the prelude to the coming of the Lord as things get worse, people become more evil, the world becomes more wicked. You know, even yourself, you'll say things seem upside down, things don't make sense. There's so much sin running rampant, it seems to have the upper hand. The evil is winning and all these kind of things. And I know these kind of things have happened throughout human history, but it's intensifying. The technology and the sciences have arrived where literally the prophecies of all eyes seeing Christ return and uh, the power that the Antichrist will have and the false prophet and then then the worship, the beast, it actually seems like it comes alive. Listen, all that stuff is all possible now. 
And if you believe, you believe that we're, 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 at the, we're in the prelude of Christ's second coming, the second advent, well, then you must realize that the Antichrist is already alive. And things are all being put in motion over in the Middle East. And for all the wickedness and how things keep intensifying and we see the hellish road that nations go down and what they want, they want, they want, they want one worldism and globalism and that humans trying to band together, going to save the planet, supposedly save humans, but they want to depopulate actually the world and actually save the world because they worship world, the create, the creation rather than the creator. But you see all these things coming and it, 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 listen, it's, it's not quite yet. Because you have to understand that we're living in perilous times. Like it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, that I'd really like to leave, uh, read to you. People are going to be liars, deceivers, cheaters, and, and, and everything else under the sun. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And, and you could take that and, and run with that, but listen. We're in a prelude to the second advent of Christ. So things will become more troubling, more turbulent. The Lord said it's it's going to happen. It's going to it's it's going to build up and more treacherous, more trying even for us as believers, as we are living in the prelude to the second advent of Jesus Christ. And you need to think about those two words: fear not. Just fear not. Fear not is spoken to us like these two words were heard 2,000 years ago by Joseph and Zacharias and Mary and those shepherds and the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Paul then to Timothy to the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 by the angel of the Lord. They heard, fear not, listen to me, as they lived out their part from their place in which they were without fear instead they lived out their life for Christ in humble boldness not fear so I think we we are to follow in their footsteps as we live as we have life and breath and plenty of opportunity is witnessed during the prelude to the second advent of Jesus Christ following their footsteps I beg you, and maybe you don't, and maybe you're not there, and you don't even go there, and that's fine with me, but, but I, there's, there's too many people. It's where they go. I'm begging you, don't let the contemporary okay, cripple you with fear. Just don't. Okay? You guys want to come up? Thank you. And listen, because there's plenty to be fearful about, even about all those, all those diseases and bugs and germs and viruses we can't see, they're coming to get you. Be careful. You as a believer, don't go on lockdown. Emotionally, spiritually, up here, don't, don't go on lockdown. And and whatever you do, you know, when you think about your Christianity, and if you if 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 you're fearful about what mainstream media gives you, what the news is, all they're trying to paint a pretty good picture right now. But but I'm I'm telling you, it's it's not good. Listen, don't give up. You know, in fear, don't give up. And in fear, don't give in. Don't give in to the mantras and the propaganda of the day. Just don't. Don't. Choose, choose, choose life. Now, you've heard it in a different way, but choose life. Choose life. Choose life and then live it. Will you? 
Live it as, live your life as children of light. That's what Paul told the Thessalonian believers. And not only that, and I have to be, I have to be through. Listen to what Jesus said for us. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. That's very good, isn't it? Peace. You got a peace internally. You got a peace. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to be a nervous wreck. You don't have to be full of anxiety. You don't have to get lost in a bottle. You don't have to get lost in, uh, you know, all the marijuana they're selling now by way of smokes. You know, you can smoke for your mood and whatever and get lost in that. You can lost in all kinds of things. No. The Lord Jesus said, I've spoken to you. I've given you my word and my promises. And he said uh, uh, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have what? A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, I certainly hope so. But he said in the world, you shall have what? Tribulation. But, but he said something else. He said, but, now the Lord says, but too. He said, but, but what? Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Here we go. Be of good cheer. What? I've overcome the world. Lord, I pray you help us what we've heard today and, and thank you for the fear knots that are in the Bible. I, I just touched the surface of, of this type of thought, but help us as Christians. And there's a lot to, that we probably are concerned about. And, and we have our own families that are so dear to us and we, we, we love them and we care. And sometimes we're very concerned. That we realize we don't have control. We, we have responsibilities, duties, obligations, but it, a lot of things are not in our control. But you are Lord. And I just pray that you'd help us to fear not as we live out this life that seems to be in so many ways throughout the world. It's so conflicted. It's so confusing. It's so disoriented. It's so dis, uh, it has a dystopia to it. it it's, it's upside down from what God has ordained in many ways. But help us to be of good cheer. You've overcome the world. And help us not to live in fear, but live in the joy and the fullness of Jesus Christ and the life that he has offered us, given to us, and help us that we would, as he wants of us, that we would live out his will in our lives as we work through the prelude to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen.